worship with us now. As I come into your presence, past the gates of praise, into your sanctuary, till we're standing face to face. I look upon your countenance, I see the fullness of your grace. I can only bow down and say, You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, Abba Father. You are worthy of all praise, to you our lives we raise. You are awesome in this place, Mighty God, you are awesome in this place, mighty God, you are awesome in this place, Abba Father, you are worthy of all praise, to you our lives we raise, you are awesome in this place, mighty in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. Join us in prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for this moment. God, help us to remember that this is a moment of worship. And though we can't see each other right now, God, we are gathered together as Union Baptist Church to worship you. God, let today be a moment that we see you more clearly. God, let today be a moment of celebration. Let it be a day of rejoicing. Let it be a day that we know that our Savior is risen that he has paid our debt, and that he has called us our, his children, that he has called us his friends. God, we thank you that that is true for each and every one of us. And, and for those of us who haven't placed their faith in Jesus yet, God, that, that is an offer for each and every one of us. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this moment. Let it not be in vain. Let it not be wasted. It's in your holy name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning and happy Mother's Day. You know, if it wasn't for our mothers, we, we wouldn't be here. Literally, we, we wouldn't be here, but also so many of us can honestly say that we are the people that we are because of our mothers, because of the faith that they, they showed and the faith that they modeled, because of the lives that they lived, um, so that we could have good lives as well. And I know personally I would not be who I am without Sheila K. Bell. That woman is a saint, and she is amazing. So, Mom, if you're watching this, which I'm sure you are because you watch everything I do, um, happy Mother's Day, and I love you. But happy Mother's Day. It's a great, great day. It's a great day to celebrate mothers. So make sure you, if you, your mother is still here with us to uh, reach out to them. Tell them happy Mother's Day, how much you love them. And uh, I know so many of us have lost their mothers. And uh, just say a prayer of thanks to the good Lord that you had a mother who, who cared for you and loved you. You know, this time we, we, we try not to talk about it too much, but can't really get by it that things are different right now. You know, we have this whole pandemic thing and, and it seems like opinions are starting to ramp up. And uh, I want to just say that I promise that there are discussions going on about what we're going to be doing in the coming weeks. We're, we're trying to take into account, obviously, the gospel. We're trying to take into account our witness here at Union Baptist Church. We're trying to take into account the health of our people. We're taking all of this into account. Um, but what I don't want to happen for anyone, no matter what side of the debate you may be on, is for you to miss what God is doing right now. Uh, over in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 and 19, we read these words. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I don't want us to be so consumed with the idea of things getting back to normal that we miss what God is doing right here and right now. 
yes, I long for the time that we all get to come back together and it's a Sunday morning like normal and, and like it used to be. I'm excited for that. But I don't want to get so fixated on that that I miss this new thing that God may be doing, the stillness that he is teaching us, the rest that he is giving us right now, the ways that he's allowing us to trust him in this time where we have a lot of reasons to be anxious and to worry, to lean into his presence, to lean into his peace. I want to enjoy the new thing that God has for us right now. And even though we, it feels like we're in the desert, even though it feels like we're in the wilderness, it promises there in 19 that he will make a way and he will, he will give us rivers. He will give us a source of life. He will give us good things even when it doesn't seem like good things are anywhere to be found. So this morning, even though it's still not completely comfortable for me to be talking to a camera right now, even though I miss everyone, even though I wish I could be giving everyone a hug here in a second for our greeting time, Right now, I want to lean into the new thing that God is doing. I want to lean into what he's doing here at our church and across the nation. And I want to step in to the hope that he has for us, the life that he has for us, and the lesson that he has for us. Don't miss it because we're waiting for the next thing. Be present in this moment. Continue to worship with us. Oh, 
wonderful to know the love of God and to return that love back to Him in praise and worship, and we are so blessed to have uh, just an opportunity to, to sing together, uh, whether it's here in the sanctuary or whether it's in your home. We just love the Lord because He has loved us. Uh, as we're getting closer to Mother's Day, I just want to say Happy Mother's Day to everyone at home. I know this Mother's Day is going to be a little different than other Mother's Days. Uh, we're still dealing with that, even in our own family. Uh, so we just want to let you know that you are loved. Um, hopefully that you'll get to spend some time with your families, if, even if it is social distanced. Uh, you're going to remember a lot of things from this year of 2020. There's going to be a lot of times when we think back to what happened in these moments that will be triggered later on, and sometimes we won't even realize it. I think that memories are not just things that we think about, but there are sights and smells and experiences that we have that trigger memories. And so I think about this time next year, 
the smell of Lysol and Germex will probably come to my mind as I think about Mother's Day and Easter and all of those important events that we celebrate because we are tied to our senses and our memory. Uh, I know you've got probably... Uh, experience that in your own life, that you have smelled like a, a scent of, of a rose or perfume or cologne or, or just uh, even food. I mean, I, I'm, I reminisce about the days of going to a restaurant and smelling uh, the food that, that is in those restaurants. And you, we get tied to memories, and that's how we make connections. I think that's a part of how God created us to help us in our memories, is to have those moments where we have those sensory experiences. Uh, This morning, as we look at God's Word, Peter had one of those moments where he had a sensory remembrance of something that happened, and it is important because it is recorded in the Bible. It's a very interesting uh, experience that Peter has, and it's very specific. Now, there are times when, uh, when we don't know exactly what happened in Scripture. The Bible tells us, as John has uh, in his book, that there are other miracles that Jesus did, and they didn't even include them in Scripture. And yet they are very specific about certain things. And this is one of those experiences that as Jesus gathered the disciples on that shore and broke bread with them and ate fish with them, he gave them an experience that would recall to Peter's memory of the last time he experienced something like what he was involved in at the moment. Scripture tells us in John chapter 21, we read this passage of Scripture last week, that Jesus was there with a charcoal fire. Now, why would that be important? Well, if you go back to John 18, 18, Peter, when he denied Christ, was around a charcoal fire. This passage of Scripture we're going to read today is about restoration and how Jesus restores Peter and deals with this issue of his uh, denial in those three times before the rooster crowed. That's one of the reasons we know this passage is so closely linked together that the experience that Peter had at that charcoal fire and this charcoal fire that Jesus is restoring him is so significant. It is that God wants to do that in our lives. He wants to bring about restoration. So I've entitled this passage, A Love That Restores. That's found in John chapter 21, verses 12 through 17. If you will, follow along in your copy of God's Word. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. Now this is the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And so when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, Son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Shepherd my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. This is an interesting passage, one that if we're not familiar with some of the older language, we might not even catch some of the little nuances that are going on here. We can see in this idea that love is restoring Peter, and and understanding how this functions helps us to know how it functions in our life as well. First of all, a love that restores begins with God. It begins with God. That is a a statement that is throughout Scripture. The Bible teaches us that God is love. That is part of His character. That is part of who He is. When you make that connection between God and love, they're one in the same. We understand God to be holy, and He is just, and He is loving. I believe that His holiness and His separateness from us is first and foremost in understanding who God is. And out of His holiness, there is a perfect love, and there is a perfect justice that comes from Him. 
And some people will only see that idea that God is just and that he's going to punish sin and that God is angry in some sense. Well, it's because our sin has earned that justice that God is going to bring upon mankind. But because he loved us so much out of his holiness that he has provided a way that we can be forgiven of our sin. It is because of his love that he's reached out to us. It is because of his love he allowed his one and only son to come and be the sacrifice once and for all for our sin. He loved us so much. Scripture teaches us that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God began the restoration that we needed because he initiated it. The Bible also teaches us in other places that we really don't know how to love, and we did not love God first, but God loved us first. And that's how we can now love God, is that we've seen the perfect example of what restoration looks like, what forgiveness looks like. Because of the holy God, who knows that we deserve the just judgment and the the penalty for our sin, stepped in and he loved us. Now we know what it's like to be an enemy of God and yet be forgiven of that so that we can experience his great love. God demonstrated his love toward us, as Romans 5, 8 says. He demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, God isn't just about telling us about love and just some ethereal place that love exists and we haven't transcended to that point yet. God allowed us to see the demonstration of his love when Jesus Christ came and he died on that cross. This is the third time that Jesus has appeared to the disciples after the resurrection. And the reason he is dealing with Peter in this way is it is not only an example for Peter, but it is also an example for us that Jesus sought Peter out. Peter, again, last week we talked about it, he wanted to go fishing. And he wanted to go do some things on his own, and, and uh, maybe he was confused. Maybe he just was misguided for a moment. But even in those moments where Peter was misguided or, or wondering or wandering, Jesus was right there seeking him out. And, and I believe that that is true for us as well. God has initiated his love toward us in that wherever we are, even though we were sinners, Christ died for us, but even where we are now in confusion or in a place of, of wandering, Jesus is still right here because he loves you. He loves you. I've heard people do this before, pre preachers do it before, evangelists do it before, that if you take that verse of John 3.16 and, and you utilize the word you instead of world, in saying, for God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son, or if you personalize it and you say this verse out loud, for yourself, you could say, for God so loved me, or insert your name there, for God so loved Brian that he gave his only begotten son. Because this love was for each and every one of us. This demonstration that God does provides for us the grace and mercy that we need. And then God, in his love, sustains us. Not only to save us, but he is there to work with us throughout the rest of our lives. That's why he allowed the Holy Spirit to come into our lives. Is because he loves us so much, he didn't want to leave us without the power and ability to say no to sin. And because he indwells us, we have God with us. I thank God that he has loved us so much that he didn't just save us and then one day he's going to take us home, but that he is walking with us every step of the way throughout this life that God is right here with us. Whether he's in a sanctuary or whether he is there with you at home, God is near. And so God is seeking some of you out. You might be wondering, you might be wandering, you might be walking away from the things that you know God wants for your life, and yet God is right there if you will just turn to him. His love for you is amazing. It is so deep and so, so wonderful, so wide, that we can't even begin to even grasp the, the idea of what love truly is. And I believe we're going to see a lot more of it when we get to heaven. He's shown us so much already, but there is so much more love that God has to show for our lives. It begins with God. 
but understand that God's love is not just something out there and it's just beyond our reach. God allows His love to impact us. A love that restores impacts us personally. It impacts us personally. Jesus loved Peter enough to confront him in his sin. You see, when Jesus showed up, he wasn't just to say, Peter, it's okay. It's all right. He was there to deal with some issues that Peter had. And and, and when you love someone, you need to talk things out. When you love someone, you need to get things straight. When you love someone, you don't want there to be any barriers between you and them. And Jesus demonstrated this by reaching out to Peter individually. He, He was there to to love on all the other disciples as well, but there was an issue that was nagging at Peter that he needed to get right. I believe that Peter knew exactly what he was talking about when Jesus entered this discussion. If Did he love him? And he was confronting him on his sin. Now, if we go back and read uh, in the original language, in the Greek, there's some interesting things that kind of pop out. There's some interesting things that speak to us in a, in a subtle way. When we look at the word love, we just see the word love. It's, it's understood kind of in our own definition what that means. But in the Greek, there are different, I think there's actually five different ways that love is expressed. We talk about three main ones. There is agape love, which is the God type of love, an unconditional love that goes beyond. Uh, there is phileo, uh, which is a brotherly type of love. There is a, a, uh, an eros love, which is what one would feel toward uh, the sp- a spouse. There is different, uh, even love that is uh, for family, and there is a love even for yourself. So there's five different types of love that are in the Greek. Well, when Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? He actually, the first time, says, do you agape me? Meaning, do you love me with a godly love? The response of Peter is that, you know I love you, and he uses the word phileo, meaning a brotherly type of love. Well, Jesus then asked the question again, Peter, do you agape type of love me? Do you love me with an unconditional love? And Peter then answers again, I love you phileo, meaning a brotherly type of love. And so in the third time, I mean, twice is enough, really. Uh, The third time, we, we kind of guess that that may be because he denied him three times. He's giving him restoration for each of those uh, denials. But the third time that Jesus asked this question, he says, do you love me? He says, do you phileo me? Do you really? Almost as if he's asking the question, you've already said twice that you love me like a brother, and Jesus is almost asking the question, do you only love me with a limited brotherly type of love? And Peter's exhausted at this point. He, he is, he is uh, grieved, as the word says, that he, he says, you know that I phileo you. I love you. And so Jesus again gives him a command. I think that Jesus wasn't only restoring Peter in that opportunity to come back and not deny Christ, but truly accept Christ for who he was. He's reminding Peter through all of these events that there is an unconditional type of love that Peter should have for him. One, he is placed on a boat, looking for fish, and Jesus reminds him of the day that he called him out of that life of being a fisherman of fish to be a fisherman of men. And he accepted willingly, of course, that he was a sinful man and that he followed after Jesus. There was an unconditional following at that point. And Jesus wanted to remind Peter, remember when you were there and you you came willingly to follow me wherever to do whatever you you know i desired for your life and so peter really needed to be reminded of that moment but then you have to think about how he reminded him also of the breaking of the bread an opportunity of fellowship don't you remember peter when we were in fellowship and there was one that was in the group that was going to betray Christ, don't you remember that we were in that moment and you said, nobody's ever going to take you from me? That type of commitment? Jesus is reminding him of 
even the words that Peter had said to him through these events. And then also to, see, to, to smell that charcoal, knowing that Peter needed to remember even that moment he denied Christ and said a phileo type of love is a limited type of love. And what Christ was doing as he was restoring him is a personal thing that Peter and only Peter had to deal with with Jesus. There were other disciples there, and he could have gone into that discussion. We're going to read next week about uh, the other disciples and Jesus' treatment for them. But right now, Jesus is wanting to deal with Peter. And I believe that there are times when Jesus only wants to depend, uh, only wants to uh, work with us. Maybe there's a reason that Jesus is speaking a word to you. Sometimes we sit in church and we've said, oh, that was a good sermon. I wish so-and-so could have heard it. I wish somebody else could have heard that sermon. And we forget that maybe it's that the reason we're so excited about that sermon is God's trying to talk to us. All of a sudden we realize Jesus is personally trying to make a difference in our life. And we need to pay attention to what Jesus has to say to us. A question comes to us. Do we love God in a brotherly type of way? Or do we love God in the agape type of way that is unconditional, unwavering, that will go to any lengths to see that love fulfilled? I believe that there are people today that, that have a knowledge of God. They have a, a desire to, to claim a family with God, and yet they're not willing to give their life for God. There are people... Other people in this world that, that when they come to Christ and they are in countries that, that don't accept Christianity in their cultures and they will be persecuted because of it, there are Christians out there to say, I am willing to give my life to Christ. And I believe there's a difference. I believe in just having a familiar type of idea of, of God, but truly in a different way than having a, an unwavering, unconditional love for Christ that will do anything and everything to promote his name, and to live for him. What kind of love do you have for Jesus? Because it impacts your life personally. Love that restores begins with God. It impacts us personally, but it also continues in others. You see, the love that God is showing us is not just for us. It is for other people as well. When he talks to him and says, do you love me? And, and Peter, of course, answers, there's a command that's given in the Scriptures. He's given it three times. The first time, he says, tend my lambs. The second time, he said, shepherd my sheep. And then the third time, tend my sheep. There are different words that are used here. But the idea is that you're going to not only trust me and love me, but your love that I'm showing, the love that I'm showing to you and the love that you're experiencing and is impacting your life it's not for you alone. It's for other people. Because I believe that this passage is not just a restoration of Peter from his denial. I believe it is a commission Peter is going to need for the future. It is a reassurance to say, Peter, how far and how much do you love me? Because you're going to be faced with all types of circumstances in the future, and you need to make certain you have that agape, that unconditional, unwavering type of love. Otherwise, you could waver, you could walk away, you could do your own thing. I need you to be committed because there are important things that I have for you in the future. If you're going to love me, you're going to obey my commandment. If you're going to love me, you're going to go where I send you. If you're going to love me, you're going to follow my will and be pleasing to me no matter what anybody else has to say in this world. And Peter did face those things. We, we, we have the privilege of looking back and seeing how much Peter had to deal with persecution and being able to stand up and be bold in the name of Christ. We see him confronting people that he ran from earlier because he truly did love Jesus. I think this was a milestone for him. And I can only imagine that Peter in his life, whenever a charcoal fire came up, was reminded of his question 
do you love me? I believe that that's a question in our day and time we need to ask. Not only have we experienced the love of Christ, not only have we allowed it to be uh, an impact in our life, that we are going to claim that we love God, but are we then going to allow it to continue into others? Jesus' command to Peter to feed my sheep was a command to love the people around him, to love those who may not look like him, who, who may not act like him. It was a love that he experienced in his rebellion or in his denial that he needed to realize Jesus still loved him and he cared for him. He reached out to him. He connected with him and he confronted him in his sin that would be the same type of love that Peter would need to show to others. It's interesting that we read in the book of Acts that not only did, G did Peter have to confront those who took Jesus' life and he boldly stood up to them and after being told not to preach about Jesus, he agape Jesus enough to keep preaching about Jesus. That even later on in the book of Acts, when he sees Cornelius, and he understands that he is a Gentile, that he allowed the love of Christ that was shown to him to be shown to Cornelius and for his household to be saved. I believe that God, when he confronts us, there's a reason. It's not just to deal with our sin. It's not all about us. It is about the greater mission that God has to reach the world for him. So when God confronts you in your sin, don't rebel, don't go a different direction. Take the, ch the chastisement of, of the Lord because he loves us and know that God is going to use you in the future to do great things for his kingdom. Bigger than, uh, than us. Bigger than an individual. Bigger than what we can imagine because God's word was going to flow through Peter in the time that we've seen since then, but God's Word is going to flow through your life to reach people that we haven't even yet seen. Be encouraged. Know that God's love is a reconciling kind of love. It is a love that restores, and it's a love that we can not only experience from God, we can return to God, and we can share that love with each other. I believe we're in a time where people need to love one another. There's a lot of back and forth and arguing and uh, all of these different ideas of how we should treat one another. It comes down to loving God and loving our neighbor as ourself. And what a great way to show the love of Christ in reaching out and not looking at all the differences that we have or not seeing each other for, uh, for what color of our skin is or what uh, our social position is or, or, or who our circle of influences are, but that we love people like Jesus loved us unconditionally and that we share that love with people around us. Let's pray and ask God to show us again, remind us of the love that he has shown us, but also love one another in that same agape type of love. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your love is so wonderful, so deep. It is amazing. Your grace has been poured out into our lives, and, and Lord, we need to share that love with others. We need to allow our lives to be an example. It needs to be a lighthouse. It needs to be uh, a place of refuge for those around us to see that you truly love us. You loved us enough to confront us in our sin, but you loved us beyond that so that we could be restored to a holy, righteous, loving God. We pray this morning that we would remember the love that you have shown us and that we would show that love to one another. We thank you, Lord. We know that you love us, and we want to love you with an agape type of love pray for everyone's safety and health, and we pray God to bring us back together soon. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to
Tchau.